Just like when getting the members of a struct in C to get the field of an object in Java, we use the dot operator. And so we write object.field, where object is an expression evaluating into an object, and field is an identifier, it's the name of the field. We also use the dot operator when we wish to invoke a method, because we can't just call a method by itself, we have to invoke it via a particular object of its type, of its class. And so we write object.method, where object is an expression evaluating into the object, and method is an identifier specifying which method of the class, and then afterwards in parentheses we put the list of arguments, and the arguments are separated by commas, just like in C. So here, for example, apple.banana. Apple should be a variable holding an object, and that object should have a field named banana, and this whole expression, apple.banana, returns the value of that field. Here, apple.banana.orange, what's happening is that the dot operator is left to write associative. So first we get the field banana of the object apple, and then from that field banana, which is an object itself, we get the field orange. And so this whole expression evaluates into the value of that field, orange. Here, nadine.ed, with parentheses, this is uh, invoking the method ed of the object nadine, and it's an empty argument list, so no arguments are being passed to the method. Here now, again, we're invoking the method ed of the object nadine, and we're passing no arguments, but then the object returned by that method, we are getting its field, Laura. And here it's the same deal, except once we get back the object in the field Laura, we are invoking its method called Dale, and again, we're passing no arguments. It can be a bit tricky to catch on to this chained dot operator syntax, so here's all the same expressions, except with explicit parentheses to denote the precedence. Variable declarations in Java have the same basic syntax as they do in C. First we put just put the type, and then space, and then we choose a name, and we end with a semicolon. So here, for example, we're declaring a variable named m, which is of type moose. Now a very key thing to understand is that we are not creating a moose object. This is just creating a reference variable. m can be assigned the address of any moose object. Actual moose objects, like all objects in Java, all instances, live on the heap. Never in Java do you have an object itself living on the stack. It's only references to objects that go on the stack. And when we declared the moose type to have two fields, one of type rat and one of type hamster, those two fields are themselves just references. So the moose object is somewhere on the heap, but that object consists of just two references to other objects elsewhere on the heap. Now, when we create a variable like this, without giving it an initial value, it has the default initial value of null. So right now, m references nothing. To assign m a moose object, we first need to create one, and we create objects with the new operator. We write new, and then we write the type, and then surprisingly afterwards we put a list of arguments. In this case, the way we define the class moose, it doesn't take any arguments when we instantiate it. So here we're just going to write m equals new moose and then no arguments. This creates a new moose object and assigns it to the reference m. And of course, we can combine these two statements into one. In our declaration of m, we can assign it an initial value. So why would you ever supply arguments when you instantiate a class? Well, the answer is that classes can have special methods called constructors. A constructor, quite simply, is a method which is invoked at instantiation time. The purpose of a constructor is to set up an object, to do whatever is necessary to put that object in a proper initial state. What counts as a proper initial state depends entirely on the class. You may find that in smaller classes you really don't want to do any setup work whatsoever, so you don't really want to include a constructor. And in fact, if you don't include a constructor in your class, Java will automatically include what it calls the default constructor, which is basically a constructor that does nothing and takes no arguments. But if you do want to define your own constructor for the class, to do so, you write it just like a method, except the name has to match the class name, and you don't declare a return type, because the return type, obviously, is the class type itself. 
So here, for example, is a constructor for the class Moose, and this constructor takes no arguments, and I've alighted over whatever business it might do. A very common thing to do in a constructor is to assign the initial values of the fields. So here in this Moose constructor, I'm creating a new rat and assigning it to the field R, and then I'm creating a new hamster and assigning it to the field H. Inside any constructor or method, the reserved word this is a special reference that references the object itself. So each time the Moose constructor is invoked, this refers to the object being constructed, the new Moose object. And so when we assign to this.r, we are assigning to the field r of that new Moose object. Another common thing to do with constructors is to have the default values for the fields come from parameters to the constructor. So here we're defining the moose constructor to take one parameter of type hamster and one parameter of type rat and then assigning them to the appropriate fields. So when we create a new moose object with this constructor we would supply first a hamster object as the first argument and then a rat object as the second. There's actually quite a bit more to say about constructors but we'll come back to them later.